for April the 2nd, 2017, Lesson 5. We're coming from Unit 2, which is titled, God's Caring, Saving, and Upholding Love. Our lesson title is, I Got Your Back. Our devotional reading is taken from the Gospel of John, Chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. Our background scripture is Psalms 23. And our printed passage is also Psalms 23. Our key verse, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalms 23 and 1. Our lesson name as a result of studying this lesson that we should be able to do these things. Explore Psalms 23 use of the metaphor of shepherding for trusting in God. Appreciate ways that God loves provides goodness and mercy to people when they face challenges. And thirdly, choose to trust God's leading which transforms challenges and difficulties. I got your back. In this familiar psalm, a use of metaphor, which is uh, borrowed from the scenes of pastoral life, which is attending sheep, which the writer David was familiar, he describes God's provincial care in providing refreshment, guidance, protection, and abundance. Therefore, because of these things, they provide grounds for confidence in God's perpetual favor. So we find in verse 1 of our lesson where it states, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David, having understood both the needs of the sheep and the many cares and duties of a shepherd, he compares himself to a sheep, a creature that, that is weak, defenseless, and foolish, and he takes God to be his provider, preserver, and director, his shepherd. No one has a right to consider themselves the Lord's sheep or a child of God unless their nature has been renewed or that has been regenerated. For scriptural description of unconverted men and women does not picture them as sheep but as wolves or goat. We have to understand that all mankind are not the children of God. All are creations of God, but they are not the children of God. There is only one way to become a child of God, and that is by having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. John 1.12 states, For as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. We also find in John 14 and 6 where it says that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and no man cometh to the Father except by me. So David said that the Lord 
is my shepherd. He was acknowledging a covenant with Almighty God. Now understand this, that a sheep is an object of property. Not a wild animal, but it is owned by a shepherd or its owner. And its owner set great store and value upon that sheep. And, and it is frequently bought with a great price. He does not say that the Lord is the shepherd of the world at large. No, David brings this down to a personal relationship. He said that the Lord is my shepherd. If he is to be a shepherd to no one else, he is a shepherd to me. He cares for me, he watches over me, and he preserves me. A personal relationship. This is something that we need to understand. That this is not a group salvation in the sense. First of all, it had to be a personal relationship. Where we say that the Lord is my shepherd. That, that the Lord is my savior. And he goes on to say that I shall not want. In Christ, we have all the things in abound. Not because we have a large amount of money in the bank. Not because we have skills and ability with which to earn a living. But because the Lord is our shepherd. Psalms 34 and 9 states, O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The Lord is our shepherd. The Lord has promised that he will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. Verse 2 states that he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me besides the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. What are these green pastures. They are, they are the scriptures. They are the word of God which is always fresh which is always rich and never exhausted. They are sweet and full of doctrines of the scriptures which is fit food for the soul. Just as the tender grass is natural nutrients for the sheep when by faith we are enabled to find rest in the promises of God's word. It is, it is the Lord who graciously enables us to perceive the preciousness of the truth of his word and then to feed upon his word. It says that as newborn babes that we are to desire the sincere milk of the word that we might grow that just as we need food for our natural bodies we need the word for the growth of the spiritual person that we as Christians as men and women we need the word of God to to feed upon us for us to feed upon them for, for, for us to be strengthened for us to grow into a to saints that that where we have a, a healthy diet of God's word that we might grow and, and that we might be able to lie down and rest in God's word that we might be able to treasure and not fear in the promises that the Lord has made to us regardless of the situations around us that that we might be able to lie down and rest in God's truth and that we can find rest for our soul. Jesus stated in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your soul. There is rest 
there is peace in the word of God. He says that he leads me besides the still waters. That is waters of rest and quietness. Not to the rapid torrents or rushing white water streams which by reason of the noise they make and the swiftness of their emotions that the sheep are frightened and not able to drink of them. But he leads us, he leads us to the still waters, pure and clear and motionless, and that go gently and softly. That that the spirit is many times is represented by the water. And that he leads us and that it refreshes us so that what we might drink that 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 thirst might be satisfied verse 3 of our lesson states he restored my soul he leaded me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake he restored my soul the best of saints should understand that all of us are capable of going astray. In 1 John 1 8, it states, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That 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 we are capable, okay, and that though God may suffer his people to fall astray into sin, he will not permit them to lie still in it. He will not permit them to just to just to anchor down and stay in sin. For when God show them their errors and give them repentance, he leads us back. He restores our soul. He restores the fellowship that that we had with him. Our relationship is not destroyed when we a saint might stray away, but that fellowship, but then he restores, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He lead us in the paths of righteousness. The believers, the Christians should desire to be obedient unto God. We should have a desire in our heart to want to please the Lord. Not out of fear, not out of uh, uh, anxiety uh, uh, that he might strike us down dead or, 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 or destroy or hurt one of our loved ones. But it should be from the obedience of love. It because is that he first loved us, that he loved us so much that undeservingly that he gave his best for us, that it, why, even while we was enemies, he sent his son Christ to die for our sin. And, and that love should compel us because the love of God for what God has shown us, that he's shown us that how much he loves us. And so we should be obedient not to just sum of the word and neglect the other part, but we must not pick and choose, but we must obey all his words. A lot of us today, we live in, in a society today where, where we want to pick and choose God's word. We want to talk about God's grace, but then we want to ignore about God's wrath. We want to ignore that, that how that God chastised those that he loved. We, we want to just talk about his mercy, his mercy, but we never want to just consider that his holiness, which is the central, which is the center of his character and in the part of him that he would never deny and that he cannot and he will not tolerate sin and so since we are up under grace we think that 
this false doctrine that the devil got out there where we could just sin, 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 and cause we abundant grace that, that God has to forgive us. No, he don't. God will not, never. He will never tolerate sin. That's why we have to confess our sins and then let him cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we really want to see how much God despises sin, look at what God did to his son on Calvary's cross. It wasn't the Romans. It, it, it wasn't the Jews the, that crucified Jesus. It was God who made his soul an offering for sin. Is that he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And that God had made his soul an offering for sin. And that it pleased God to bruise him. So that why? So that he can justify us. So that he can forgive us. And he can have fellowship. Where the door can be open. Where a man could come back to a holy and a righteous God. And so, and so we out of that, we ought to choose to obey him. Why? Because we love him. Because he's been so merciful and so good to us. And that, and not only that, he wants to lead us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Why? For his name's sake. So that we might live a life that is of sanctification. And sanctification is this. Is that we are set apart for God's use. That we are set apart for God's purpose. And that we are set apart so that God might get the glory in our life. And, and it should be to the honor of our great shepherd. That we should be a holy people. Walking in the ways, the paths of righteousness. Many a times, people see the Christians and they say that because of our conduct and the, the hypocrisy that we as Christians, we portray. People don't want no part of this so-called, what they call Christianity. It say, look at all the hypocrites. We bring shame upon, instead of bringing honor upon the name of the Lord. So it should be our honor that, it should be <clears throat> our desire that, that, that we would want to live a life and walk in the path, in the pathway of righteousness for his name sake. Verse 4 saying, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. David still speaks of the shepherds protection, and guidance. As one of his flock, even as his life draws near to the grave and the sorrows and death, the sorrows of death compass him about and he would be on the brink of the borders of eternity that he should be fearless of evil. Death is a frightening thing. The unknown or what's on the other side, it, it terrifies folks. But because there is no evil in it to a child of God, there is no fear, no terror, I should say, shouldn't be in it to the child of God. Because what? We have the word of God where 
those those green pastures that we can rest in where God tells us in his word that death cannot separate us from the love of God. David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that thou art with me, that he is not going through this valley, not staying in the valley, not not being uh, uh, lying down or, or, or buried in the valley, but he is just going through the valley, passing through. And and, and, and so and, and so for us as we should not be fearful because we should understand that that nothing can separate us from the love of God and therefore it can do no real harm. David said that he is walking through the shadow. He is walking of the valley of the shadow of death. A shadow is just something that is cast off from a a, a object or or a, a, a body. The shadow of a serpent cannot bite. The shadow of the a sword cannot cut because it, it is just a shadow. And so for the Christian, because of what Jesus Christ had defeated death when he rose from the grave, he said, all power is in my hand. Where he, by his resurrection from the, the dead, that he defeated death and the power of Satan. And so the Christian is just walking through the shadow of death. And that, and that he said that what? That thou art with me. And we need to understand from God's word, word that God said that he is with us through all trials and tribulations. Romans 8, 38 and verse 9 says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. So even, even as we go through that valley of the shadow of death, he say, thou art with me. I shall not be alone. Sheep or timid Christians, and so are Christ's people. We are timid. But when the shepherd is there, and when the shepherd is near to sympathize with them, with us, up under all our afflictions, to revive and comfort us with the warmness of his love and the promise of his grace. He bears us up and supports us with his mighty arm and to teach us and instruct us that he would never leave us or forsake us. The fears are driven away and he causes us to pass through the dark valley, the deep waters, and the fiery trials with courage. Jesus stated in John 14, verses 16 to 18, he said that I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you have known him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you I will not leave you comfortless I will come to you the Lord abides the spirit of God abides the Holy Spirit abides and dwell in each individual believer truly 
believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said that he would, uh, would not leave us comfortless, comfortless, that he would be with us through the dark hours, through the, through the trials and, and the tribulation, through the storms, that he would be there with us. He would never leave us or forsake us. Thou art with me. It says that thy rod and thy staff comfort me. The image that we see here is that of a shade, uh, excuse me, a uh, shepherd in attendance of his flock, with a staff on which he leans with one hand, and in the other hand he has the crook or the rod which a shepherd used in guiding his flock, in directing his flock. You have seen pictures of it with the with the curve at the top. The that's the that's the rod or the crook in which he guides his flock. Either one of these also might be used to guard the flock. To drive off the enemies of the flock, to protect the flock from the wolves, from the from from the lions and the birds, but but the word that that the shepherd would use them as a weapon to defend his flock. The crook is also is said to have been used to seize the legs of the sheep when they try to wander off. With his rod and staff, the shepherd rules and guides his flock to their green pastures and defends them from their enemies. David said, they comfort me. They comfort me. The sight of them consoles. They show that the shepherd is there. The sight of them imparts confidence, showing that he will not leave us alone, that he will defend us as his sheep, as the sheep of his flock, that, that, that as, as the people, that, that we got a Savior that, that defends us even when we go astray. That, that we have a high priest in the very presence of God that, that was tempted in all points as we, yet without sin, that he stands before our Heavenly Father, making intercession for the saints, that, that his presence is near, that, that he defend us. So now, now why should we fear? We had God's word to depend on that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of our life. Of whom shall we be afraid? We have a great, a almighty, the omnipotent God that defends and protects and keep us. We have a great shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And I lay down my life for my sheep. And he also said in John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Thou rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Just, just to know that your presence is near. Just to know that his presence is near. We should be comforted. And where can we find that comfort? We find that comfort that he has written for us in his word. That's, that's the green passage that that we should 
consume. That's that's the word of God that we should eat upon constantly. So what? That our inner man might be renewed day by day. That that all those fears and and and, uh, and the fiery darts that that Satan in his life throws upon us, where that that word would distill those fears. Well, then we can trust in God. And he says that thou prepares a table for me. Verse 5 and 6. It says that thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. The Lord's people, we feast at his table upon the provisions of his love. Satan and wicked men are not able to destroy them or us, or our comfort, while we are anointed, they are anointed with the arm of the Holy Spirit, which represents soothing anointment, and that, and that, and we drink of the cup of salvation which is ever full, that the cup of salvation never runs out. That that cup of salvation, it means that we have been delivered. It means deliverance. That we have been delivered from the penalty of sin. And that that we are being delivered from the habit and dominion of sin. Of sin ruling and the and Satan in our life that that we are being delivered through the power of God and the Holy Spirit where where sin de, does not dominate us no more and then that one day finally we will be delivered from the very presence of sin we will be delivered from these old sinful bodies and we will be delivered out of this old sinful world and that what we would this cup runneth over what? That we will be in the presence of God to all eternity. Never ending refreshing joy. And it says that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord had promised that he was going away to prepare a place for us. And he said that if I go away, I will surely return where I can receive you unto myself. And there we can dwell with him in the house of the Lord forever. That God will allow his mercies and his goodness that he would follow us all the days of our life. All the days of our life. As we those who are maturing in age and, and the saints begin to really to stop and to look back. I have found in, in, in my experience of life that that as I begin because I, I realize now that that you know if the Lord tarries that I have I have less years ahead of me than I do behind me. But then I begin to look back and and, and, and reflect and, 
and I can see that from the very beginning of my existence, though at many, many days and time that I did not realize it, but, but I can see it now and look back that it was the Lord that, that, that his mercy and goodness has been with me all the days of my life. It wasn't no coincidence. It wasn't no luck. It wasn't no uh, uh, because of me or, or, or because of the favor of, or, or, of somebody I knew or some man. But it was because of God's mercy and his goodness. I have seen that. Now I realize that all during those years, even up to the day, it's still the same. It's because of God's mercy and, and, and that the Lord is good and, and, and that the Lord he, he has always he, he he has always had our back Psalm, Psalms 136 and verse 1 says oh give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endureth forever it has always been his mercy. Even when we did not realize that. That 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 his mercy that his mercy did not give us what we deserve, which was death. It kept us from receiving our just rewards. And that it was his grace, Lord Hammer, it was his grace. That he gave us something that we did not merit, earn, of deserve. But because of God who is rich in mercy with his great love with which he loved us. Even when we was dead in trespasses and sin. And so it is grace by which we are saved. Not of works lest any man should boast. We can't boast about it. But it is totally and completely and utterly has been, is, and will be all of God. Why? Because God has had our back. May God bless you and keep you.